In a lot of ways, the COVID-19 pandemic has been like a zombie apocalypse. This is a very contagious virus. Today, all but a handful of states have issued stay-at-home orders in an effort. A global outbreak of a seemingly uncontrollable virus, coupled with civil unrest. America is locked in battle. Nearly 19,000 Army National Guard troops are now deployed all around the country. Senior investigative correspondent... Social isolation, mass hysteria. These protests are almost an incubator for coronavirus for a few reasons. Economic collapse. The coronavirus pandemic will cause the worst global economic fallout since the Great Depression. Yeah, I'm worried about it. Seriously worried. That's basically the stage for every zombie movie or TV show that's ever been made. But what of the novel human coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2? Is this a zombie virus? Well, the simple answer is no. At least not in the sense that other neurologic conditions can mimic zombieism, as we'll discuss in our program today. But the more complex answer is that coronaviruses are highly neurotropic, and they can manifest with a wide range of neurologic side effects. Confusion, memory impairment, seizures, and severely altered sensorium. I'm sure you've seen this in your own practice. And then, more importantly, what are we beginning to see among our COVID-19 survivors? All that we know about the long-term consequences of COVID-19 is preliminary data. The virus's recent emergence precludes us from knowing these long-term consequences from infection. That said, some data indicates that patients with COVID-19 are being discharged from the hospital with persistent encephalopathy, particularly with symptoms of inattention and disorientation. As many as a third of patients who are admitted with COVID-19 will be discharged with this persistent state of delirium. And this, in spite of any direct neurologic effects of the infection, like a stroke or encephalitis. We have a better understanding of the long-term consequences of related coronavirus infections, such as those that are caused by the original SARS virus. Survivors from SARS often reported memory impairment and difficulty concentrating, as well as dysphoria. More than one in eight patients who had SARS, or the related coronavirus, MERS, reported ongoing difficulties with concentration, memory impairment, fatigue, and emotional lability. Also, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder have been commonly reported with these other viral infections. And it is possible, although not certain, that we will see a similar post-COVID-19 syndrome in the months and the years to come. I digress. Today's program is actually about zombieism in neurology and the pathologic states that truly mimic the cognitively impaired, ataxic, or aggressive behavioral phenotype that we classically associate with this fictional condition. But before we get into our program this week, I want to reiterate an important disclaimer that we provided in the original broadcast of this episode back in 2017. I'd like to warn any listeners out there that today's episode will feature discussions about real neurologic disorders and how they may appear similar to our cultural understanding of zombies. But this doesn't mean that if you have spinocerebellar ataxia or frontotemporal dementia, as an example, that you're a zombie. Or if you contract the coronavirus, that you're one of the walking dead. We mean no disrespect by making these comparisons, and if it offends you, please accept our apologies. The Brainwaves Podcast is intended for medical education only, and to that end, we are going to spend the episode discussing several neurologic conditions, which in some ways mimic our socio-cultural depiction of zombies. I'm Jim Siegler. Let's get to it. This week, we're going to try to answer one question. Are zombies real? Sorry, that was Erica. <laughs> Here's the question. Is there any disease states out there that are comparable to zombieism? I bet you never thought that we'd do an episode about zombies. Well, we did. And for those of you who are sticking with the show this week, I think you're going to love it. But I'm sad to say it was not my idea to feature this topic on a Brainwaves episode. It just so happens that one of our previous correspondents on the show happens to be a veteran when it comes to zombie lore and the neurology behind zombies. And when it comes to lecturing on this topic, he makes it sound like it's a reasonable educational experience for students and the residents he works with. I wanted to make it originally like a three lecture series, you know, one on neuroanatomy in the brain, so going over the lesions in the central nervous system, one on the public health, you know, disaster preparedness, uh, and then one on the cultural aspect and more like toxidromes and things like that. And, but I've been using this as a, as a lecture 
once a year, right around Halloween, when people get you know excited about this type of stuff. At the time of our original recording, back in 2017, Dr. Hanrahan was a senior neurology resident at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He has since graduated and is in his second year of epilepsy fellowship at the University of Rochester. It was really fun. I did this as a medical student, got credit for it, actually. And I gave this talk as a fourth year. And then, you know, as I've continued my training, it's kind of matured a little bit to be a little more higher, higher level of, uh, of education. I gave it to the internal medicine residents last year, and I plan on trying to do that maybe sometime in the spring. But yeah, it, people pay attention. It's cool to take a very uh, pop culture topic and make it so it's educational. Yeah, I mean, what what was the instigator? What was the impetus that drove you to this talk? I mean, in all honesty, I think it started when I was in in college, actually even going back farther to high school, when I watched the first Dawn of the Dead movie that came out, I think, in 2004. And uh, I just remember watching that and wondering, you know, what kind of virus could cause this? What kind of abnormalities in the brain can cause this? And obviously, as a, as a high school student, you, you couldn't really answer those questions. But as I continued my training, I kind of realized, you know, I can actually use what I'm being educated on to, to answer these questions. And then in my fourth year of a medical school, I thought this was a really cool topic to teach not only neuroanatomy, but also some practice on public health and virology and other kind of infectious stuff. Nice. Well, I think it's a fantastic idea. And it does not surprise me that so many people are interested in it. And there are so many other kind of cultural concepts that have probably been born out of some medical underpinning, some sort of medical background like vampirism and, you know, werewolves. I'm sure that there's some sort of medical historical element to why people thought, you know, I think that there are vampires or I think that there are these other weird people out there or there are, could be zombies. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think, you know, if you looked back at the, the historical references of where the origins of the term zombie comes from, it's primarily from Haitian folklore uh, where, you know, people were put to death by a necromancer and then brought back to life and they, they became slaves and that were in this kind of zombie form. Um, and they became kind of aware uh, in the United States that this was going on in the early 1900s. But it wasn't until like the 1980s someone actually tried to figure out how zombification was happening in these cultures. There was a famous ethnobotanist uh, named Wade Davis, and he tried to analyze the concoction that these uh, sorcerers were using to put these people in this kind of dead-like state and reanimating them, and outlined that there was probably a concoction of tetrodotoxin as well as another thing called uh, datura. So we, we get taught about tetrodotoxin in medical school. This is a, a compound that's found in a number of animals, uh, most commonly known as the one in pufferfish that will act on the uh, sodium channels, preferentially in the central nervous system, while largely sparing the cardiac and peripheral nervous system. Additionally, the, the tetroda flowering plant that was also believed to be in this concoction had a lot of anticholinergic effects, which could probably lead to some type of anticholinergic delirium. And that's kind of the, the origins of zombies and zombieism. However, it kind of went through a pop culture evolution, starting early uh, with George Romero's movie, uh, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, however, over the next, you know, most recent last few decades, there's been a dramatic explosion in the interest in zombies with blockbuster movies like Dawn of the Dead, World War Z, uh, as well as popular TV shows like The Walking Dead. You can hear it. Some of you saw it. They got back here, half of them, still enough to surround us 20 deep. So with this kind of new renowned interest in, in this, like you were talking about with, you know, zombies and uh, vampires and werewolves, certain physicians took real interest in this and tried to make a explanation how this can happen in real life. Look, I know you're scared. You haven't seen anything like this. And there are a lot of other pretty decent explanations to zombieism in neurology, in addition to what Brian already mentioned regarding the tetrodotoxin anticholinergic concoction that was prepared by the Haitian necromancers in the late 19th century. And you can find some of these on a PubMed search. Yeah, so there's been about 145 articles that have zombie in their subject line. 
Uh, and I think that has actually increased pretty regularly and more than just linearly since I started presenting and talking on this subject. If we group it by year, in 2000, there was only one article with a zombie in the subject. By 2005, two articles. 2008, four articles. Seven papers in 2009, 10 in 2013, 12 in 2014, and 17 in this year already. Considering all the available scientific, peer-reviewed literature on zombies, more than half of these publications emerged in the last three years alone. Some of the talks are related to disaster preparedness, which we've talked about before. Others kind of are related to parasites and uh, host behavior manipulation. The common one that we learned about growing up uh, in medical school and beyond is Toxoplasma gondii. Normally, this parasite has a natural life cycle between their definitive host and cats and their intermediate hosts, the rodents. And rodents, when they're infected with this parasite, they no longer avoid areas that have high likelihood of having cats, uh, which increases their chance of completing their life cycle. Meaning the mice would die. And there are plenty of other examples of parasitic manipulation of host behaviors, some of which sound pretty terrifying. So the cordyceps fungi is a very species-specific fungus that interacts with ants. And when uh, the specific cordyceps fungi interacts with a specific ant, it will lead to them to having very irregular behavior. What they will actually do is they will leave their colony, climb up to the perfect place where this fungi can grow on a piece of uh, vegetation, and the ant will lock its jaw onto that vegetation... Now the ant, since it's stuck there, will actually die, and then the fungal hyphae will actually grow out of the ant's exoskeleton uh, in a location perfect for its growth. So those are some of the things that, that you can find when you look up zombieism on PubMed. But the more impressive things that have been published in the last year or so have been related to toxidromes that present with zombie-like behavior. There was a very good article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that outlined a zombie outbreak related to a synthetic uh, cannabinoid. The title of this cannabinoid was labeled AK-47, 24 karat gold. Some of you probably remember this paper. 18 patients from Brooklyn were evaluated for bizarre behaviors, and they appeared zombie-like. Slow to respond, having a blank stare, being lethargic. They were groaning, had slow mechanical movements, and some behaviors you might actually see in advanced Parkinsonism, or that you'd see in zombies. Without having any focal neurologic findings or vital abnormalities. And if the New England Journal published a paper on a zombie outbreak, then we can definitely talk about it on a podcast. So liquid chromatography was performed on the inhaled cannabinoid that was labeled AK-47, 24 karat gold, and it revealed a product called AMB Furbanaca, which is known to be about 85 times more potent than normal THC and 50 times as potent as the compound that was found in early outbreaks of K2 synthetic cannabinoid products. I mean, that sounds terribly potent. Very much so. And I think what was one of the interesting things about this compound, too, compared to other synthetic cannabinoids, this one didn't have the concurrent side effects in their vital signs. So they didn't have the accompanied tachycardia, arrhythmia, hyperthermia, or acute kidney injury. The compound that was isolated from these 18 patients was a structural analog to a chemical produced by Pfizer called AB Fubinaca. In 2014, the AMB formulation was isolated from several intoxicated patients in Louisiana, and it was linked to a drug affectionately known as Trainwreck 2. It's, it's really tough because a lot, a lot of these compounds actually don't really have the proper testing for, and that's why you have to do the liquid chromatography to find. And the difficult thing was actually when they did liquid chromatography of the samples collected from patients, None of them had this compound because it's broken down. So they did find one of its derivatives in their system that suggested they did inhale this agent. So unfortunately, a lot of these patients that have kind of these very unusual responses to these synthetic drugs, it's really difficult to be able to analyze for because you're not exactly sure what you're looking for in the first place. And so the authors of this New England Journal paper suggested that their behaviors were zombie-like because they were encephalopathic and groaning and moving slowly? Exactly. 
Did they have the same ravenous appetite that you see in patients who are stoned? <laughs> so they did not talk about that part of in their uh, in their journal. It seems like they may have been too encephalopathic to really have what you would call, uh, you know, scientifically as the munchies. One of my favorite books that uh, kind of cover this is one by Dr. Stephen Schultzman, uh, a psychologist from Harvard Medical School, who wrote a book about six years ago called The Zombie Autopsies, where he covered uh, a disease which he termed as ataxic neurodegenerative satiety deficiency syndrome, or ANSD. This book is not unlike the story presented in the 2007 film I Am Legend, based on the 1954 novel by Richard Matheson. In both the film I Am Legend and the book Zombie Autopsies, the protagonist has committed his life to the study of these undead creatures. In Zombie Autopsies, Dr. Stanley Bloom, who was actually infected by the zombie virus, studies zombies as if they were patients suffering from a neurologic disease, and he stratifies them based on the severity of their symptoms. Progression from being moderately affected with some extreme hunger and a coexisting fever to progressive cognitive decline increasing hunger, impaired lucidity, changes in balance, and then progressing to frequent falls and aggressive behavior. And then the fourth stage where people are no longer classified as humans, where they're profoundly hyper-aggressive, have global aphasia and loss of uh, complete awareness. And while this may currently be a fictional neurologic disorder, a toxic neurodegenerative satiety deficiency syndrome, there is some real science to back up how such a disorder may occur. If A and SD were real, or if it could become real, it would be the result of a destructive process rather than an activating one. And just like any other condition in neurology, the goal is to localize the lesion. There's about six or so lesions that you would see in the central nervous system that could present similarly to a patient with ataxic neurodegenerative satiety deficiency or zombieism. Again, we mean no offense by making these comparisons. They are just observations. Usually, people like to think that they have some frontal lobe dysfunction that would be comparable to patients that have frontal temporal dementia. Uh, There is some comparable semiology to these two diseases, including disinhibition, apathy, loss of emotional recognition, compulsive behavior, hyperorality, and dietary changes. A lot of people think that people with zombieism have also cerebellar dysfunction that you could see maybe in like uh, spinal cerebellar ataxia, where you would have this wide base, unsteady gait with lateral veering and exaggerated difficulty with turns. Uh, And this would be very different than the fast-paced variant zombies that you would see in certain movies like the movie World War Z 28 Days Later, as opposed to the slow-moving zombies that we'd see more classically in The Night of the Living Dead and the book World War Z. There's probably also some enterograde amnesia that would be present in these patients that would be due to bilateral hippocampal dysfunction, where there'd be problems with declarative memory. So they wouldn't be able to remember, you know, following someone for a long period of time, they would get distracted and do something else. And we also know that the hippocampus has a a very large role in spatial navigation. That's why zombies look like they're wandering around. Another example of a neurologic disorder similar to zombieism that Brian refers to in his talks, and this one is a little more of a stretch, is the Balint syndrome, a bilateral parietal lobe disorder characterized by the triad of optic ataxia, oculomotor apraxia, and simultagnosia. And in particular, the simultagnosia element may be the most relevant here for zombies. There's been some fictional examples of zombies being distracted by fireworks or fire or something else very specific in their surroundings that would allow others in the periphery to escape. And have you ever tried to talk to a zombie? That's an easy lesion to localize. It would be safe to assume that all zombies would have damage to their Wernicke's and Broca's area in their dominant hemisphere. And then lastly, there's probably some damage to their pain pathways, probably more specifically to their spinal reticular pathway as opposed to the spinal thalamic one, because the spinal reticular pathway really has more of a involvement of the arousal aspects of pain or the emotional relation to pain, as opposed to the spinal thalamic pathway, which is more related to the discriminative aspects of it. But you have to wonder. What kind of disease would account for this type of multifocal destructive process? And Brian gets asked this a lot from his peers. 
So people usually ask, what do you think is like the best example of a vector out there that would be a good launching point for this type of disease? My favorite one is probably the rabies virus, being that it is transferred primarily through bites and saliva. It would be the perfect candidate for the type of spreading that would occur commonly in all the fictional stories with zombieism. So potentially a very highly virant lysavirus, which is the class of rabies. Not to mention other infectious particles like prions, which can cause a rapidly progressive dementia, a toxic gait, and other features that are similar to what you might see in a zombie movie. And then there are toxicities, like the ones that we mentioned before. One toxicity that we haven't mentioned, like K2 and other synthetic cannabinoids, is that seen in bath salt abuse. Being blamed for a gruesome scene in Miami. This is a naked man. He was shot dead on Saturday by police because he was gnawing off another man's face. Obviously, that the assailant from this episode, Rudy Eugene, was found snarling. He was not following commands. He was acting with extreme disinhibition and aggression. It's no wonder that he was later called the Miami Zombie. 31-year-old Rudy Eugene was described to be in a zombie-like state when he was caught by police. The victim was 65 years old, truly horrific. Apparently, all that's left is his goatee. Uh, his eyeballs were gone. His face, it is, it is unbelievable. I guess going back to your original plan when you started giving these talks to your med school, you staged it in three ways. The second way was discussing zombieism from a public health perspective. And I was extremely surprised to find that the American Red Cross and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention both provide zombie action plans on their websites. Can you kind of summarize their recommendations and why did they ever come up with them? (laughs) Yeah, so I think that the American Red Cross and the CDC saw an opportunity to reach out to a very uh, young community that normally wouldn't have had any interest in disaster preparedness. And that's kind of how they spun this part of their care. In 2011, uh, the CDC launched this kind of zombie preparedness campaign where a lot of people kind of reached out to them and said, you know, we want to actually have this for our communities, for our kids. Um, so a lot of material was created for this reason. And then in 2013, the American Red Cross did the same thing where they helped uh, kind of get people aware and, and prepare for disasters by creating uh, what's called a go bag, which is a bag that contains all the necessities in case one needs to perform a hasty evacuation from wherever they're living. I think that a lot of that does make sense. And I think it's not unwise to plan for emergency evacuations like this, especially in light of recent events that we've seen in Central and South America and uh, as a result of these recent hurricanes. Absolutely. How worried do you think that people should be? How scared do you think that people should be that something like a zombie apocalypse or a massive outbreak could occur? Uh, I think uh, the likelihood of a a zombie outbreak occurring in our lifetimes is, is very low. Probably worth mentioning here is that neither myself nor Brian are epidemiologists or virologists. We don't work for the CDC, and we really have zero credibility when it comes to predicting the future of a major outbreak. We both just happen to like zombie movies. Although I think we should always be prepared. Um, (laughs) But the second thing you said for uh, a severe outbreak, I think that is, is much, much more likely to occur at some point. You know, we've already seen outbreaks of H1N1 and swine flu and Zika. And- exactly. Things that could become easily endemic uh, with how uh, global every culture has become. That, you know, is something that really we should be aware of. Well, I must say, I think that you're the first zombie expert that I've ever spoken with. <laughs> I appreciate you coming onto the show and talking to us about zombies for the Halloween episode. Oh, it was my pleasure. I'd love to do it again sometime. That wraps it up for our zombie episode special this week. Thanks again to Dr. Brian Hanrahan for joining me in 2017 for the original recording of this podcast. This week's episode of the Bramus Podcast was produced by myself, Jim Siegler. Zombie music was courtesy of Andrew Sacco, our Sonor Gantarian, and Unheard Music Concepts under a Creative Commons license. Sound effects by Mike Kunick, and original recordings out of Studio 3. Our theme song was produced by Jimothy Dalton. To prevent the next zombie apocalypse, please wear a mask, wash your hands, and be safe if you're thinking about trick-or-treating this year. The calories and the COVID 
probably aren't worth it. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you soon.